So I was just leaving the gym here in Yukaipa, not planning on doing much tonight, but then I noticed there's a 510 starting up at Morongo. The reason I wasn't really planning on playing today is because yesterday I played 12 hours, ending a session at five in the morning, kind of exhausting and it doesn't really make you want to play the next day, but here we are. And I figured it's a good chance to bring you guys along for the ride. I'm happy to report good things from last night though. I won around 22,000 in a 2550 game. So things seem to be trending back in the right direction. Let's see if we can keep that momentum going tonight. Not only that, but next week, I'm gonna be playing big games again on Hustler Casino Live on Thursday and Friday. So if you guys are interested, tune in. If not, you know the drill. I'll summarize all those hands in the following vlog. One quick thing though, before we head to Morongo, I'm gonna be playing on Club GG on September 4th across all stakes, ranging from 50 cent a dollar up to 510 no limit. So if you guys are interested in joining, hit the link in the description. It's pretty quick and easy. And uh, maybe I'll see you on the virtual felt on that day. If not, no worries, there's always next time. But uh, anyway, that's enough talking. Let's head to Morongo and play some 51020. All right, guys, here we are once again at Morongo playing 5, 10, 20, no limit. There's quite a few hands to go over today, so we're going to go over them a little bit quicker than normal. Otherwise, this video would be about an hour long. But with that out of the way, we get into the first hand where I look down at the best possible start to a vlog, pocket aces. There's an early position limp. I raise it up to 75 and get no less than four callers, including the button, big blind straddle, and the limper from early position. So five of us going to a flop. Not necessarily the best when you have pocket aces, and even more so when it comes seven, six, five, two spades. Most likely, we're not going to have the best hand anymore, so when it checks to me, I check it. And now the button bets $125. Pretty small bet relative to the size of the pot. Big blind calls, and then the straddle calls as well. Early position folds and it's back on me. Now, I know I just said most likely we don't have the best hand, but after the button bets small and neither of the players behind them check raise, I feel like aces are in the lead, so I make a somewhat questionable decision and decide to check raise up to $800. This isn't necessarily theory backed or anything like that. It's more feel poker, if you know what I mean. The button ends up folding and the other two players do as well. So happy with the result and glad we didn't have to see a turn card. In the next one, there's a late position open to 60, button calls and I look down at ace jack suited in the big blind. Good enough to re-raise, I think so. I make it $300, and they both make the call. So with 900 already in the middle, we go to a flop of ace, nine, deuce with one club. This time, a much better flop than the last hand. I continue with a small bet of $300. First player calls, but the button gets out of the way, so only two of us remaining as we go to a turn, which is the six of spades. This time, I think my hand is a good one to slap into the check category. The reason I say that is... You know, sometimes we'll have hands that want to check but are still good enough to call an all-in. And ace-jack seems like a decent candidate to do that with. So I check it, and he jams all-in for $1,085. Obviously a non-decision here. We quickly make the call as we're beating all smaller aces and random bluffs. The river is the four of hearts. Unfortunately, this time we are not running into random aces or a bluff. My opponent shows ace-king. Kind of a cooler, if I'm being honest, but uh, such is life. We move on to the next hand where there's a late position open to 60. Button calls, so similar situation to last hand. This time, I'm in the small blind with pocket sevens. Once again, worth raising, I think, especially out of the small blind, so I kick it up to 300. And now the straddler on my left makes it 800. Other players fold, and it's back on me. This particular opponent is capable of having multiple raises before the flop without aces or kings. Rather, what I'm trying to say is he could still be bluffing, and we're getting a decent price. So, although folding seems more than reasonable, I decide to call and go to a flop. Jack 4-3 with two clubs looks alright to me. We'll often still have the best hand, and I feel even better about it when I check it over to him and he checks it back. However, the turn is not one I had in mind. It's the king of clubs, so now a ton of hands that he might have been bluffing with before the flop improve. I check it again, but a bit surprisingly, my opponent checks back a second time, so... Not entirely sure where we stand in the hand at this point. River is the six of hearts. 
Nothing to do but check a third time. He quickly checks it back. And we end up winning versus Ace-3 of Spades. So I guess in a weird way, we're lucky there was a 3 on the flop. Perhaps it made my opponent not want to turn his hand too much into a bluff. And we win this one. Next, there's a button open to 50. Now I look down once again at Ace-Jack in the blinds. This time the offsuit variety. I kick it up to $250. Interestingly enough, the straddler cold calls the 250, but the button folds. Not what I was anticipating, but it's all good as we go to a flop of 9-5 deuce rainbow. Pretty neutral board, I think, so I continue with a small bet, just like I would with all my hands. He doesn't care, though. He makes the call, and we see a favorable turn card. It's the Jack of Spades, giving me top pair, top kicker, in a somewhat disguised fashion, I think, too. So, good opportunity to size up and get a lot of value, I think. I make it $900, and sure enough, he thinks about it for a little bit and makes the call. So, we're off to see one last card with... Around 2,600 already in the middle, and it's the six of spades. Shouldn't really change anything, I think. He's got around $5,000 behind, so I think a few different options are on the table here. Betting all in, I certainly would not hate, since if I had a bluff, betting double pot seems reasonable. But I think we can accomplish the same thing with around two-thirds. And what I mean by that is if I had a bluff or a good hand... I think betting two-thirds is a good number to put him in a tough spot with hands like pocket tens or pocket eights or any non-believing ace high or perhaps a nine. This particular opponent was quite sticky and seems to have trust issues. I don't want to go all in for double pot and put myself in a position where I'm only getting called by a better hand. So after thinking it over for a while, I decide to bet $1,675. Luckily, we don't get snap called, which I guess is good. But at the same time, I don't want to hear all in. That would be a disgusting spot. After a few seconds, though, it seems apparent he does not want to raise. Instead, he seems uncomfortable with the situation, wondering what to do. That's music to my ears. Now we just get to cross our fingers and hope he calls. A few seconds go by, then a few minutes, before eventually he decides to fold. So not the desired result, but still, I'll take it. In the next interesting one... Action folds to me in the small blind and I raise it up to $80 with ace-queen. Only the big blind calls and we go to a flop of jack-10-9 with two spades. So I've got an open-ended straight draw as well as a backdoor flush draw. I bet $50 and he calls. The turn is magical, guys. It's the king of hearts giving me the nut straight, but any queen now makes a straight. For that reason, I decide to check it over to him and pray that he has a queen. Then we could check raise and try to win a really big pot. Seems like that may be what's going on because now he bets $100 after I check it. Now it's time to spring the trap. I make it $500 and he calls. So things are looking good. Hoping we get a clean river and we can get a lot of money in. And that's exactly what happens. It's the deuce of hearts. Now the pot's around twelve or $1,300 and we have a question of how much to bet. If he has a queen, let's be honest, he's just not going to fold. Most likely unless I bet like a ridiculous amount. But I think $3,000 is still very reasonable, right? So that's what I put into the middle. Like I said, if he's got a queen, it's time to get the absolute max that we can. And that's exactly what happens, guys. He says, if you got it, you got it. I call. Sure enough, I got it this time. I turn it over, and we end up winning a very big pot after an awesome turn card. Nothing too impressive about coolering people, but, you know, it's part of the game, and I'm happy to be on the right end of it this time. Moving right along, in this next hand, the double straddle is on to 40. There's an early position limp, and I look down at king five of spades in late position. Questionable, but I think it's worthy of a raise against one limper, so I make it 150, and it immediately backfires as the small blind, big blind, and that limper call. So instead of heads up, we're going four ways to a flop, but it's a decent one, 10-4 deuce with one spade. So we've got an overcard, a backdoor flush draw, a backdoor straight draw. I know, I'm getting really speculative here. But all in all, it's a decent board for me. I think we're not really going to be in too much trouble unless someone flopped a set. And we could continue to apply a lot of pressure across multiple turn and river cards. So when it checks to me, I continue with a $300 bet. Small blind calls, big blind folds. And unfortunately, early position jams all in for less than my bet, around $290. I was especially hoping he would fold, but now that he's all in, I don't really see any merit to bluffing the small blind as we continue to a turn which is the ace of hearts. The reason I say that is there's no side pot to be won, so even if I manage to bluff the small blind out, I still have to beat the player who's all in already, which obviously king high won't be able to do, so 
For that reason, when the small blind checks, I just check it back. And we get a smidge of hope on the river as we make a pair, five of clubs. Small blind checks again, still not looking to bet, so I check it back. And we end up losing versus both players as the small blind turns over pocket queens and early position who jammed all in on the flop ends up winning it with ace jack. So uh, good for him, I guess. <laughs> Somehow the king five does not end up winning it this time. <sighs> unlucky, you know, unlucky. Next, there's a button open to 50 and I defend the straddle with jack six of diamonds. We go to a flop of ace jack deuce with two spades. I check and he bets very tiny, $15. A little bit disrespectful. I make the call and we see the seven of spades on the turn. I check it again, this time he checks it back and we get another seven on the river, the seven of diamonds. Now obviously our hand is pretty straightforward. I think checking another time is more than okay but I like to do this once in a while when I have a decent strength hand where I bet the size of the pot to try to make it look like a bluff and try to incentivize my opponent to call with a light hand like king high or a small pocket pair in the hopes that you know my hand looks like a misdraw of some sorts plus i could certainly have some bluffs after calling a very small bet on the flop so with second pair i think it's a good chance to do that i bet 150 right around the size of the pot my opponent calls right away of course sometimes we'll be getting called by better hands that's just the nature of trying something like this but this is not one of those times as I turn it over and we win. So we get a little extra value with the jack six. Next, the double straddle is on once again, $40. There's a limp from late position and I kick it up to 200 out of the small blind with seven six of hearts. Not the best hand ever, but I think it's good to do it with hands like these once in a while so that, you know, when I've got aces, kings and queens, the good stuff, it's not so predictable. Only the late position limper calls, so we're going to go heads up to a flop out of position of jack 7-3 with one heart. Decent, you know, decent to flop a pair. I bet small just like I would with any of my holdings, and he makes the call. Turn is the three of spades. Now I don't think our hand is good enough to continue betting for value, but it is still good enough to win at showdown sometimes, so I check, and he checks it back. River's not great, it's the ace of spades, so now we're losing to even more hands that we were perhaps ahead of previously. I check it again, he checks it back, we end up winning somehow, so not entirely sure what he called on the flop with that doesn't try bluffing later on, but hey, no complaints, I'll take it, and with that we move on to another double straddled hand, this was a very lively table as you guys could tell, $40 is on, middle position opens to 100 and I look down at ace queen in the small blind, pretty powerful cards, so I raise it up to $450 and the initial raiser calls, so going heads up, out of position once again, to a flop of king eight three with two diamonds. Decent flop, I think. We've got the ace of diamonds, so we can represent some stuff. And there's a king out there, so, you know, I could have one of those, right? I bet $275. My opponent is undeterred as he makes the call. Turn is the deuce of clubs. Shouldn't really change anything. If I had a good hand, I would continue betting, so, you know, having a bad hand shouldn't really change that. I bet $900 this time. Unfortunately, my opponent could see right through that as he makes the call once again. Now I've played with this guy quite a bit and based on what I know about him, if he had a hand like pocket tens, nines, you know, maybe even a weak king, he probably would have folded on the turn. So alarm bells are going off in my head. The river comes to the four of diamonds and even though normally I would continue bluffing I think on this particular card, I don't think this is a right opponent to do it against. Like I said, after getting called pre-flop, on the flop and on the turn, I get the feeling he's got a really strong hand, so I decide to give it up, wave the white flag, and check it. And after a few seconds, he decides to check it back. I turn it over, not expecting to win this one, and sure enough, we're not, but I'm a little surprised to see him flip over pocket kings for top set. I guess there was a little bit of concern on his end with a possible flush out there, but nice hand, man. Next, the 40 is on once again. This time I've got pocket queens, much better than ace queen. I raise it up to $100. Player on my left re-raises to $350. He started the hand with $2,000, which considering that the $40 double straddle is on, it's technically 50 big blinds. So when it gets back to me with pocket queens, I'm definitely getting it in there. So that's what I do. I announce all in for around 2,000 effective. My opponent calls. I turn over my hand, letting him know what I've got right away. And he shows ace king. So a classic flip, if you will, tournament style. We're off to see a run out with over $4,000 in the middle. Flop looks great. 
Turn card, not so much. It's the King of Spades, and the river is a little salt on the wound as he makes two pair with the Ace of Hearts. So we're not going to win this one, but what can you do? In the next one, there's an early position open to 75. Small blind calls, and I call in the straddle with 10-5 of spades. Three ways to a flop, six, four deuce, one spade. So we've got a straight draw and some backdoor possibilities with a spade out there. Small blind checks, and on this kind of board, I think the big blind, or rather the straddle, which is where I am, it's going to have a lot of stronger hands than the early position razor. So I think it's a board texture where leading makes sense. That's what I do this time, $150. Early position Razor folds, and the small blind calls. Two of us going to a turn, this time we're in position, and the Queen of Clubs comes out, putting out a possible flush. He didn't seem too excited about calling on the flop, so I don't think he's got a flush draw. If he has a six or any sort of medium strength pair, he's not going to like this turn at all. So when he checks again, this time I size up to $500, and it gets the job done as my opponent lets it go. Moving right along, in this next one, there's another open to $75 from late position, though. And I'm next to act on the button, looking down at Ace King. Great cards, so I'm going to put in some money. $250 it is. Action gets back to the initial raiser, and he calls. So we're going to go heads up to a flop of 775 with two hearts out there. He checks. I bet small, $130. And he makes the call. Turn card is interesting. It's the seven of spades, putting three sevens on the board. And he checks it over to me once more. Now, obviously we have hands like aces and kings as a possibility to represent, but with ace-king, I think it's enough showdown value where checking back and calling some river bets makes sense. If I had a smaller ace, like ace-four suited, for example, I think I would continue betting, but like I said, ace-king seems just strong enough to try to pot control and get to showdown with. So that's what I do, and we see the nine of spades on the river. Now, if my opponent leads out here, I'm most likely going to call, depending on the size of the bet. But it doesn't come to that as he checks once more. I check it back, and we do end up beating ace-queen. So, not a bad result. In the next fun hand, there's a $40 double straddle on, early position limps, and I look down at ace-five suited. Good one to raise, I think, so I make it $200, and only the limper makes the call. Flop comes down ace-eight, deuce, one spade. Good board for me, so when he checks, I bet $130, and he makes the call. Turn card is a six of clubs. He checks it again, and once again, we've got a good hand to check back, I think. This allows me to bluff catch on rivers, and it makes it a little more difficult to play against someone who sometimes could have top pair after checking back, right? So that's what I do. We see the nine of hearts on the river. Now my opponent leads out for $300, less than half the size of the pot. Honestly, it doesn't really feel like a bluff since he's betting so tiny, but what am I going to do, right, after checking back with an ace? So I put in the money, and we end up winning against king-queen of clubs. So not exactly what I was expecting, but once again, happy with the result, not going to complain. And with that, we move on to this next hand where there's an early position open to 50. I make it $200 on the button with pocket sevens. Sure, you can make a case for calling, which I think is probably the preferred route, but this time I was feeling a little bit spicy, so I re-raise... And he makes the call. Off to a flop of ace-jack-5 with two diamonds. Obviously a very bad hand for my exact holding, but overall I'm going to have a lot of stuff on this board. So when he checks, I bet small. And he makes the call. Turn card is the ten of diamonds, bringing in a flush and, you know, all sorts of stuff. This time when he checks, I check it back. Pretty over it at this point. Until we river a very unexpected flush. It's the queen of diamonds. So four diamonds out there now. He checks it again. Any king makes a straight, he's going to have all sorts of stuff, and, you know, I would be bluffing on this card fairly often. So I think even with a small flush, it's worthy of a value bet. In terms of sizing, I don't think betting big makes a ton of sense, since, you know, we're not representing either something amazing or nothing at all. We're representing flushes, which could be all sorts of different strengths. In this case, not a very good one. So I put in $325, and he folds pocket kings face up. So he kind of owned me there. Nice hand. And with that, we move to this interesting one where there's a button open to $75. Now look down at Ace-9 suited in the small blind. Picking up a lot of hands in the small blind this day. It's not necessarily great, but that's all right. Kick it up to $300, and he makes the call. Flop comes down Jack-10-9 with no diamond. So we've got bottom pair on a board where most likely my opponent's going to have something on. However... We would also have stuff fairly often on this kind of board, so I think continuing to bet is more than okay. Checking seems fine too, though. This time, I do decide to bet $150. My opponent calls. We get some help on the turn. Well, 
not really. It's the Queen of Hearts. Of course, we don't technically improve, but I could have a ton of hands that contain a king, whereas my opponent shouldn't really too often. I mean, sometimes he will, but you guys get what I'm saying. With that in mind, I think continuing to bluff is a good idea now. He could easily have hands that contain a 10 or a jack that are just going to absolutely hate this card. So I put in $600, and after thinking it over for a while, he decides to fold. So good result. I'm pretty sure we were beat. I'll take it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the last hand of today's evening. And for this one, we're playing a $50 bomb pot six-handed. That means there's $300 in the middle, 50 from each player. We get two random cards and go to a flop. I get dealt jack six of clubs in late position. Not bad for a bomb pot. And even better when the flop comes seven, five, four with one club. So we've got an open-ended straight draw as well as a backdoor flush draw. Early position leads out on this flop for $75. Middle position calls and now it's on me. I think you can make a case for both calling or raising. And the reason I say that is if I had hands like 8-6 or 6-3, I would definitely want to be raising with a straight. And I think to get away with raising hands like that, you sometimes have to raise these sorts of hands, you know, to remain unpredictable and you guys get the idea. Plus, if we get called, we've got outs to improve. And I guess the last thing on my mind is me having a six makes it a little less likely that these guys have a straight. I know, not impossible, but just a little less likely. So when it gets to me, I choose the more aggressive route this time and kick it up to $375. Sadly, both my opponents make the call, so not really what I was hoping for, but that's alright. We still got potential to win this hand later on. The turn is the deuce of spades. This isn't exactly the best card to keep bluffing on. If my opponents had a hand like an overpair or perhaps a seven, this isn't necessarily the scariest card to try to get them off those hands, but when they check to me, like I said, I'm feeling adventurous on this day, and let's be honest. It seems almost impossible that I would be bluffing in this situation. So I continue with a $900 bet this time. Action's on the first opponent now who thinks it over for quite a while before eventually choosing to muck his hand, which is a great result. Now we only have one player left in the hand and he also folds. So a very, very good result. To be honest, I wasn't really expecting to get it done on the turn. I thought this might go down to the river a little bit of warfare going on, but on the turn is more than okay with me. And just like that, we take down a bomb pot to end the night. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed the hands. So the game just broke here at Morongo. We ended up playing like six hours, I think. It's around three in the morning right now. Definitely tired, but I'm happy to report good results. I was in for 9,000 and ended up winning around 3,000 or something like that. I haven't even counted exactly how much. You guys will see right here as per usual, but yeah, a good result and a good way to uh, continue to build confidence as we head into the streams this week. Hopefully I continue to make hands this week like I did today and uh, last night. So far, so good, but as always, uh, these big games are usually gonna dictate how the year or at, at the bare minimum, how my month goes. Stay tuned for the next vlog, but as always, thank you guys for watching and don't forget about September 4th on Club GG. All the stakes, all the tables, I'll be on there. See you guys then, hopefully. Until then, good luck at the tables. Thanks for watching, peace.